This lecture is about tree widths. Tree widths measures how tree-like a graph is. So trees have uh, tree widths one, and then the more cycles and edges we add, the larger the tree widths becomes. So to build an intuition about um, tree widths or small tree widths graphs, let's start uh, at trees. So we are going to look at a few algorithms for trees. And uh, so those are algorithms that will be efficient because the graphs we are considering, they are actually trees. And then we are going to think about how to generalize algorithms for trees to more general graphs. Um, and that's where we encounter tree decompositions. And then we'll see two techniques to exploit these tree decompositions. Uh, the first one is monadic second order logic, and the second one is dynamic programming. Let us first look at the following problem where the input is a tree. And so what we are supposed to do is we are supposed to count the number of independent sets of this tree and return this number. So this is a counting problem where we have to answer with a number. And an independent set of a graph is of course a set of vertices such, such that there's no edge between any of those vertices. So we're supposed to design a polynomial time algorithm for counting the number of independent sets on trees. Maybe let's look at a quick example. So if we have uh, the following graph, or the following tree as an input, um, how, how many independent sets do we have? Uh, first of all, let's look at all independent sets of size zero. Um, there's one of those, which is the empty set. Let's look at all the independent sets of size one. Um, well, there's three of those because we can select any one vertex of this tree. And let's look at the number of independent sets of size two. And there's only one of those where we take this vertex and that vertex. So there's one of those. And the number of independent set of size three is zero in this case. Um, and of course, the, this tree doesn't have any uh, independent sets of size more than three either. Okay, so in total, we have five independent sets for this graph. Okay, so how would we go about solving this problem in polynomial time? Because we don't want to consider all subsets of uh, vertex sets. That's something we absolutely want to avoid. Uh, we want to exploit the fact that uh, our input is a tree. OK, so let's assume that our tree t is rooted at some vertex. And so what we are going to do is we are going to do a bottom-up dynamic programming from the leaves of the tree towards the root. Um, so we are going to compute some information and uh, progress this until eventually we come to the root. So let's look at one vertex in this tree. So we have already computed something at uh, its children. Um, let's say it has children u and w. And so we have already computed something for the children and more precisely from, for the subtrees that start at the children. So we have some information already on independent sets in these subtrees. So what do we want to compute for the vertex V? Okay, so for the vertex V, we have two options. Um, so we have to count the number of independent sets that contain V, and we have to, con to count those that don't contain V. OK, so let's focus on those that contain V. Um, and we're going to compute information about the subtree that is rooted at V. So only for, for those vertices that we have seen already when progressing from the leaves towards the wood. OK, um, so let's assume that we put V into our independent sets. And of course, we are not allowed to put u and w into the independent sets. So it's very useful to know now um, information about independent sets of the subtrees rooted at u and w that don't contain u or w. 
Um, so suppose you know this. Um, so then let's call this uh, number out of u. So if we know how many um, independent sets of the subtree root that u do not contain u, then we can combine any of those independent sets with any independent sets in the subtree rooted at w that don't contain w, um, and we can, can con combine them in an arbitrary way. So, so we actually have to do a multiplication here. So because any independent set counted in number out u can be um, added to any independent set counted in out w. Okay, so I think this is our formula for in of v. Um, and it seems that we also need to compute information, of course, about out of v. So now we need to uh, compute the number of independent sets um, in this subtree rooted at v that don't contain v. Um, so we could take any independent set uh, in the subtree rooted at u and combine it with any independent set uh, of the subtree rooted at w, and we can, can again combine them in an arbitrary way. Uh, but since we can take um, like independent sets of the subtree rooted at u that contain u or that don't contain u, it doesn't really matter. Um, so now we have to multiply number in of u plus number out of u. So we multiply this with number in of w plus number out of w. OK, so so now we can start at the leaf. So we have, we have to find a way to start. So in a leaf node, we just have one vertex. And of course, number in of this vertex is one. There's only one independent set that contains this vertex. And number out of this vertex is also one, because the empty set is also an independent set. And then so now these, these two formulas now we can generalize them to an arbitrary number of children. Um, and if we apply these formulas now, we can propagate all the information we need from the leaves to, to the root. And the only thing we need is that we, we need to have computed everything about the leaves, uh, about the children, before moving to the parent. So this brings me to this um, algorithm. So first of all, we select an arbitrary root of our tree and then do this bottom-up dynamic programming where we start at the leaves. And for each subtree Tx that is rooted at the vertex x, so we compute these two values, number in of x and number out of x, the number of independent sets of this subtree rooted at the vertex x that contain x and those that don't contain x. Um, so if x is a leaf, then both numbers are 1. Otherwise, well, we, we multiply this information about the children. And so if we put x into our independent set, of course, we can't put the root of any of those subtrees rooted at the children into the independent set. But otherwise, if we don't put uh, x into the independent set, uh, both, we have to consider both options. So now the final result, so we have computed these numbers for every vertex in our tree. And so the final result can be looked up by just uh, looking at the root and, and, uh, consider, and summing both numbers. So we have to consider the independent sets that contain the root and those that contain, don't contain the root. So this gives us our final result. OK, so, so we see that we have done some um, bottom-up dynamic programming. And so why does this work nicely for trees? So it works nicely for trees because 
Well, as soon as we know the information about um, the children of a, of a vertex, we can then, just based on the information at the children, we can compute the information we need at the parent node. And we don't need to look further down the tree. So we, we, as soon as we, we know everything about the children, we can forget everything that we computed before. Um, so we never have to look far away. Uh, and, and this is nice. Um, because also, once we have computed uh, the information about the parent node, we can now forget everything about the children that we computed previously. Let's consider another problem. So here we're looking at counting the number of dominating sets of some input tree. And again, we are supposed to design a polynomial time algorithm that solves this problem. So we could try the same strategy. Uh, so we look at some vertex V, our tree is rooted at some root. And suppose we have already computed information about the subtrees here. Um, so suppose we have computed for every child of V how many dominating sets there are that uh, dominate each of these two subtrees. OK, so of course, V could be in our dominating set or it could be out. Um, so if V is in our dominating set, um, what about the children? Well, the children. They could be in, or they could be not in the dominating set. OK, let's try. So here again, we have children u and w. So we say, OK, u can be in, or it can be out. Uh, and w can be in or out as well. But now are we missing something? So if we want to compute the number of dominating, dominating sets that contain V in the subtree rooted at V, um, now we are relying on the number of dominating sets in these subtrees rooted at U and at W. And we consider two possibilities, either U uh, is in the dominating set or not, and also W is in the dominating set or not. But what else could happen? Um, so if we do it like this, then we require in these subproblems that, well, in the, the subtree rooted at U, we already have a dominate, dominating set. So U is already dominated by the subtree. Um, but in general, this, this need not be the case, right? So if we look at all the dominating sets um, that contain V, um, so we add V to our dominating set, then U is dominated by V. So we don't need to dominate U by any vertex, by, by any of its children, right? Because we are, we are dominating it by V. Um, so relying only on the number of dominating sets that dominate this, this whole subtree here. Uh, so this information is not enough. Because if we just have this information, then U always gets dominated uh, in these solutions. But we also need to consider solutions where U is not dominated. Um, OK, and, and that is why we need to split out the, this number out here into two parts. So maybe, namely, U could be not in the dominating set and already dominated from below, or it could be um, not in the dominating set and also not yet be dominated from below. And we have to remember which is the case because, well, that tells us whether V has to dominate U or not. So the setup, the setup of this algorithm is very similar. So we, we select an arbitrary root of our tree, and then we do this bottom-up dynamic programming. And so the, the main difference is here 
when x is not in the dominating set, we have to consider two variants. So in out d, we consider the number of dominating sets of the subtree rooted at x that do not contain x, but they still dominate the whole subtree. And out in out nd, we consider the number of vertex subsets, so they're not necessarily dominating sets, of the subtree rooted at x that dominate everything except x. Now we have some easy computation for the leaf nodes and let's look at the main recurrences. So if the vertex x is in the dominating set, then basically we have all options for the children. They could be in, they could be out and dominated from below, or they could be out and not dominated from below. Um, if we have that, uh, if we compute out dx, so now we consider the number of dominating sets that do not contain x. So what do we need to consider? Well, the children could be either in or out, but if they're out, they have to be dominated from below because x will not dominate them. Um, plus, now we need to dominate x by a child. So the only option that we are not allowed is when all the children are out. So that's why we have we subtract here this option. And then for the case where we compute out nd of x, so now we are not allowed to dominate x. Um, so x can't be in. Uh, it has it has to be out of the dominating set, and none of the children can be in. Uh, but they do have to be dominated from below because they, they have to be dominated. So the only option we have for the children is that they are all out D. Okay, and uh, so again, we start from the leaves of our tree and we compute this information at every vertex of our tree. And now the final result, it has to be a dominating set, of course, so we can't have out N D of R. Um, but you can sum the other two numbers. So the root could be included in the dominating set or not. And then the sum of those two numbers gives us the total number of dominating sets uh, of this tree. So next we are going to consider how we can generalize these considerations that we had for trees um, to two more general graphs. And so the nice thing about trees was that well, when we start a leaf, then there's only one path from this leaf to the root of the tree. So and the, this information that we computed followed this path. So this means that well, when we consider, when we have computed all the information for the children of a vertex, then we comp comp uh, compute the information for the parent node um, but then we don't need the information about the children in anymore. So as soon as we have computed this information for the parent node, we can forget about the children. This information cannot travel through other paths through the graph um, because, well, it always follows this one single path from the leaf to the root. Um, so if we want to consider more general graphs, uh, what is it that we need? Well, we need to be able to decompose our graph in some way so that we get a similar structure. So now, if we consider this like a abstract decomposition, so now we can again say that, well, our information flows well, from the leaves uh, upwards. So maybe like this, maybe we selected uh, this vertex as our root. Um, so, and when can we do this efficiently? Well, we can do this efficiently whenever, well, there's a small overlap between this information that we need to propagate. So for trees, there was only one node through which this information traveled, right? Um, but now, even if this information travels through maybe two nodes, uh, maybe we can still deal with this. 
Okay, so let me give you first some intuition about what a tree decomposition is. So this is a graph G, and now we basically want to decompose this graph. So we can see that it's not a tree because it has uh, two cycles. Um, but we want to somehow decompose this graph in a way such that uh, well, this information flow still flows nicely. Um, for example, let, let's say we consider this vertex here as our root. Um, so for this part of the, of the graph, we are, we are not in trouble, right? Because this information can flow nicely towards the root. Um, but now, so at the first, so at the first uh, cycle here, we have a problem. Okay, so everything flows through C that comes from A and B. So that's quite nice. Uh, we can maybe summarize this information at the node C. But then when we move on, we have to somehow well bridge this, this next cycle. Once we are at H, we are again uh, happy because well, we hopefully we have summarized everything we need into this node H. Um, but to, to bridge this uh, cycle here, we have to do something. Okay, so and the way this works is as follows. So this is a tree decomposition of our graph. And uh, so what do we have here? So here we have sets of vertices. So you see that here is a set of the vertices A, B, C, and that corresponds to these three vertices. Um, and then we have our next set of vertices, which is CDE, which corresponds to these three vertices. And then we have DEF, and then we have FG. And um, so we have sets of vertices, and these sets are typically called uh, bags. So we have some bags of vertices, and they are arranged in a tree-like fashion. Um, and there's a few properties that we need. So first of all, well, every vertex of our graph must occur in a, in a bag of this tree decomposition. And then we have two additional um, conditions. So the first is the covering condition. So if we look at this edge AB in our graph, then there must be a bag that contains both endpoints of this edge. So for every edge, in the graph, there must be a bag in the tree decomposition that contains both endpoints. The other condition that we need is the connectedness condition. So now if we look at one vertex in our graph and we look at all the bags that contain this vertex, then these bags must form a connected subtree of our tree decomposition. Okay, so, so that's the two conditions we need. Um, so let's try and get some intuition uh, why this is useful. Um, well, it might not actually be useful, right? We, we could take all of our vertices, A, B, C, D, etc., put all of them into one bag, and that's it. Now we have a valid tree decomposition because, well, we are we are meeting these two conditions. Um, but I claim that, well, the tree composition that we, we with maximum bag size three is more useful and uh, we, we can get more properties out of it. Because we see here that, um, so previously we observed that, well, once we arrive at this node C, then hopefully we have summarized everything of this subgraph here. Uh, and um, so we also see that if we move from this bag to this bag, then the only intersection is the, the vertex C. So C is contained in both. And basically, that's the information we still need to propagate. Um, so we can think of uh, these bags here as uh, allowing us to propagate information through the graph. Um, so algorithmically, we will compute something at each bag of this tree decomposition, and 
Now we can start at the leaves of this tree decomposition and move to the root of the tree decomposition and compute all of this information. Okay. Um, and um, let me give you a formal definition of what a tree decomposition is. So if G is a graph and T is a tree and gamma is the labeling of the vertices of T by sets of vertices of G. Um, so G is our graph and uh, so down here we have the tree T and we also have this labeling at T. Okay, let me give you a formal definition of tree decompositions. Uh, suppose that G is a graph, T is a tree, and gamma is the labeling of the vertices of this tree by sets of vertices of G. So, so G is our graph and tree is the tree decomposition, and gamma tells us about the composition of the bags. So we refer to the vertices of the tree decomposition as nodes, just to avoid com confusion. Whenever we say a vertex, we refer to a vertex of the graph. And if we say a node, then we refer to a node of the tree decomposition. And so these labels are called bags. Now, the pair that's composed of the tree and the bags is a tree decomposition of G if the following three conditions hold. So for every vertex of the G, there exists a bag that contains this vertex. For every edge of the graph, there exists a bag that contains both endpoints of the edge. That's the covering condition. And whenever we look at three nodes of the tree decomposition and T2 lies on the unique path from T1 to T3, um, so T1 and T3 are bags in the tree decomposition, and now T2 lies somewhere on the path between T1 and T3. So then this condition says that uh, uh, if we take the intersection of the bags of T1 and T3, then this intersection should be included in the bag of T2. So what this means is that if some vertex U occurs in the bags of T1 and T3, then it also has to occur in T2. And this is exactly the connectedness condition. So we have this now for every um, bag on this unique path. So, and this then tells us that, well, if we look at all the bags that contain U, then they must, they must form a connected subtree. Okay. We already observed that uh, small bags are more useful than large bags. And that's why the width of a tree decomposition is the maximum bag size minus one. That's taken over all the bags in the tree decomposition. And uh, so the minus one is a technical detail and it's there to ensure that trees will have tree widths one. Now the tree width of a graph is the minimum width of any tree decomposition of the graph G. So the graph G could have an infinite number of tree decompositions and we take the tree decomposition with the smallest width and the width of this tree decomposition is the tree width of the graph. So I said that trees have tree width one. Um, so let's look at an example. So here we have a tree and let me name the vertices by A, B, C, D and E. Um, so we know that every edge must occur in some bag. And if we are going to achieve a tree width of one, the maximum bag size we can have is two. So we have to put A, B into some, uh, sorry, we have to put A, C into some bag. We have to put C, B into some bag. Uh, C, D goes to into, into a bag, and now D and E as well. Okay, so we know that um, C, D and D, E, so those two bags need to be connected because they both contain the vertex D. Um, and they are the only ones that contain D, so they have to be connected. 
Okay, and next we have that everybody, so A occurs only in one bag, B occurs only in one bag, and uh, C occurs in three bags. So we have to form a connected subgraph uh, out of the bags that contain C. And um, there's multiple ways to do it, but one way is to follow exactly the structure of the tree that we had. So basically, we are looking at this bag, this bag, this bag, and this bag. Let's look at a few other graphs. So we saw that trees have three with one. What about cycles? Um, so let's look at the cycle of length five. And so we know that every edge must be contained in some bag, but then uh, if we could keep doing this, so let's name the vertices again, A, B, C, D, E. So A, B is in some bag, B, C is in some bag, C, D is in some bag. And we know that these have to be connected somehow, right? Let's connect them directly. Um, DE is in some bag, and AE is in some bag, A and E, um, and A needs A and E need to be connected to this bag and to this bag, right? But now we are in trouble because we created a cycle in our tree decomposition, which is not allowed. And if we remove any of these edges, uh, then we lose the connectedness condition. Um, so, so the solution is, well, to increase the width of the tree decomposition and get rid, rid of one of the edges here. So maybe you can get rid of this edge. And now, basically, we have to make sure that the bags that contain A are connected with each other. Uh, but they're not at the moment, so we can add A to all of these bags here. So now we get a valid tree decomposition. Uh, this tree decomposition has widths uh, 2. And it turns out that cycles do have tree widths 2. Uh, the only graphs that have tree widths 1 are uh, forests. So a disjoint union of trees also has tree widths 1. Um, OK, but here we stumbled upon a, a very useful property. Namely, when we look at the graph, and when we look at the vertex in this graph, like A here, and we remove this vertex, so in this case, we would get a, a tree and a path even. So since we get a tree here, we can compute the tree decomposition of this tree. Um, and then we can add A to each bag of this tree decomposition that we computed. So we observe here that actually, so AB is also in this bag. So we actually don't even need this one. So we could remove this bag. Um, AE is also in this bag. So we could remove this one. So, and what do we have now? Well, we have a tree decomposition of this path here uh, that contains the bags containing BC, CD, and DE. And we have added A to all of these bags. And this is a, a general trick that is quite useful sometimes. Uh, namely, um, we can delete a vertex, compute uh, a tree decomposition of the remaining graph, and now add these vertex to all the bags of this tree decomposition. OK, um, now the next property I want to look at is uh, about this connectedness condition. So consider a tree decomposition of graph and two adjacent nodes i and j in t. So we have i and j and they are connected. 
Uh, ti and tj denote the two trees that we can obtain by deleting the edge ij in the tree decomposition. So we have a, a tree ti and a tree tj. Um, then this says that every vertex that's contained in both um, bags from TI and from TJ are also contained in both the bag for I and J. Okay, so, so if we have some vertex in some bag here, A, so, so it occurs in, in some bag here. And A also occurs in some bag in TI, then we know that because of the connectedness condition, well, there's a unique path from this bag to this bag. So we know that, well, all the intermediary uh, bags also need to contain A. So A is contained in both the bag of I and the bag of J. So if we can see this vertex A in both subtrees, then we can then we also must see A in both of these bags here that, that join TI and TJ. So that's a, a useful condition for doing dynamic programming. Because I well, suppose we have computed something about this vertex A over here. Um, and, and we're thinking that maybe we have to still remember this information when considering any other um, node of the tree decomposition. But then we are guaranteed that, well, we, we, we can propagate this information because we still have A in all of these bags. Um, okay, so, and the next basic fact is that the complete graph on N vertices has three widths n minus one. So basically, if we have n vertices that are all connected to each other, then the best thing we can do is put all of them into a bag. Um, and this is also the case for uh, subgraphs. So actually, if our graph G now contains a clique on R vertices, then every tree decomposition of G contains a node uh, that contains all the vertices of this clique in one bag, in at least one bag. So if you have a clique on five vertices somewhere in the graph, then we will find these five vertices together in some bag. So we're currently thinking that it's uh, probably quite useful to compute tree decompositions with small widths. Um, this is because if we look at the bag in this tree decomposition, uh, somewhere in the middle of the tree decomposition, uh, let's say it contains vertices A, B, C, and we actually delete these vertices from the graph, then our graph falls apart. So we have some part of the graph here, some part here, some part here. And uh, if we look at all the vertices that occur in, in those bags, then, um, so let's look at some vertex D that occurs in the bag here, then we know that, well, D cannot be connected to any vertex that occurs uh, in this part of the tree decomposition. But right? if E is in some bag down here and D is up here, then there's no edge between D and E. Uh, well, this is because otherwise, well, D and E must occur together in some bag, um, but that's impossible because they are not, not in this bag. Okay, so if we delete these vertices A, B, C, then our graph falls apart into multiple connected components, and so uh, the overall solution of our problem uh, can then probably be computed by considering these connected components and then combining them at this uh, uh, vertex ABC. Okay, so small bag size is, uh, is nice, 
But um, how do you actually come up with this tree decomposition? Because, well, we said there's an infinite number of tree decompositions of every graph. Um, so actually, if you take, let's, let's take just a simple graph, ABC, which is a path. So we know that this is one tree decomposition. We put A and B into one bag, B and C into one bag, and then connect them. Um, so now I could add another bag here that contains just B. I could add another bag here that contains just C. Um, I could add another bag that contains both B and C, and I could continue like this, right? So this could actually continue like this in an infinite way. Um, so there's probably only uh, an exponential number of tree decompositions that really make sense, uh, where we don't have this duplication going on. Uh, but, but still, it's a large number, and um, so how efficiently can we compute a tree decomposition with small widths? And this brings us to the tree width problem, where the input is a graph G and an integer K. The parameter is K, and the question is whether G has tree widths at most K. So the unparameterized version of this problem is uh, NP-complete, uh, and the parameterized version is fixed parameter tractable by an algorithm by, by Bortlander. And so this algorithm works in time uh, k to the order k cubed times the number of vertices of the input graph. Uh, so one thing we note here is that the number of edges of the input graph doesn't even appear in the running time. How can that be? Is, is the algorithm even able to, to read the input, let's say the number of edges is quadratic in the number of vertices, and k is tiny, then the algorithm cannot even read the input, right? Um, but this still works in this way because, well, if k is tiny, then we can't have too many edges in our graph, otherwise the algorithm can just say no. Um, because if, if we bound the tree widths, then we also have implicitly an upper bound on the number of edges. Okay. So tree widths is fixed, fixed parameter tractable. And well, this is useful because well, we are mostly interested in a, a tree decomposition when there is actually a tree decomposition of small widths. If the if the tree widths of the graph is large, then probably we are not interested in tree decompositions. Um, so having an FPT algorithm is quite useful. Uh, the dependency on k is still uh, quite large. Um, there are some other algorithms that uh, either compute an approximation just in polynomial time, or and they are also, they are also FPT approximation algorithms. So they, they compute uh, approximation um, of the tree decomposition um, with constant factor, uh, where this is actually a single exponential function. Okay, so we know that many graph problems are, can be solved in polynomial time on trees, and many of them also turn out to be FPT with parameter tree widths. Um, so if you take our independent set problem, for example, and we say, okay, the input is a graph G and an integer K, and the question is whether G has an independent set of size K, and the parameter is the tree widths of the input graph, uh, then this independent set problem parameterized by tree widths is actually FPT. And there are two general methods to, to show this. One is dynamic programming um, that works very similar to dynamic programming on, on trees, but we need to remember more information. And the other one is uh, monadic second order logic which is a general framework where if we are able to express our problem in this logic, then it is FPT parameterized by the tree bits. We will start with monadic second order logic, or MSO for short. So this logic is a powerful formalism for expressing graph properties. 
so there's some atomic operations that we can check, like uh, set membership or testing equality of objects or whether an edge is incident to a vertex, etc. And then we can also quantify over vertices, over edges, over vertex sets and edge sets. So you can say things like, for every vertex set in our graph, some property holds. And now Courcelles theorem tells us that checking whether a graph G satisfies an MSO property is fixed parameter tractable, parameterized by the tree widths of the graph, plus the length of the MXO exp expression. So in particular, if we are able to express our graph problem with an MSO formula with constant length, then we will immediately get that our graph problem is FPT parameterized by just the tree widths of the graph. Um, if our MSO expression can be upper bounded by some other parameter, then um, the graph problem with, will be FPT parameterized by this other graph parameter plus the three widths of the G. Um, and there's a generalization by Arnborg et al. that makes Courcelles theorem even more useful. Um, and here, so they give an FPT algorithm um, for the parameter three widths of G plus uh, the length of the formula, but now the formula is parameterized by a set X. Uh, so this set X is a, a free, non-quantified vertex set variable. So basically, this allows us to compute a smallest vertex set that satisfies some property. So it computes a minimum sized set of vertices X, such that the formula is true in the graph G. Um, in addition, this also works for colored graphs, where the input vertices and edges may be colored and their color can be tested. So, so more generally, uh, Arnborg et al.'s generalization doesn't only talk about graphs, but relations more generally. Okay. So now in MSO formula, it has variables representing vertices. And so this just gives a convention that for vertices, we, um, we take them from the end of the alphabet and we use small letters. Um, for edges, we actually take them from the beginning of the alphabet and also we take small letters. For vertex subsets, for, so for, for subsets, we take capital letters and for vertex subsets, we take them from the end of the alphabet and for edge subsets, we take them from the beginning of the alphabet. Um, so we have these variables, we have atomic operations, so we can test set membership. If we have a vertex subset and a vertex, we can check whether the vertex is a subset of this vertex subset. Um, we can test the equality of objects, so we can test, for example, whether two vertex subsets are the same. Uh, we can test incidents, so we can test whether a vertex is an endpoint of an edge. And now we have these connectors that are just propositional logic. So we have an and, an or, a not, and we also have implication that we can, of course, express using the previous connectors. Uh, and then we have these quantifiers, so we can quantify over uh, vertex subsets, edge subsets, vertices and edges. Okay, so these are our building blocks and now let's immediately go ahead and uh, write some shortcuts. So for example, instead of uh, equality, we might want also to test inequality. Um, we say that u is different from v if it is not the case that u is equal to v. So you can introduce the shortcut here that says u is different from v. Uh, similarly, we can introduce a shortcut that x is a subset of y by saying that uh, for every vertex in v, if v is in x, then v is also in y. Uh, so this expresses that 
x is a subset of y. This is our shortcut. Um, we can introduce a shortcut that uh, some formula holds for every vertex in some vertex subset x by saying that for every vertex, if the vertex is in x, then the formula holds. Uh, similar for the existence of a vertex in a set. And what will be very useful is the adjacency between two vertices, because so far we only have the incidence relationship here. So here we have the incidence between a vertex and an edge. So now we can say that u and v are adjacent if they are distinct from each other. So we already used this shortcut here. And there exists an edge such that this edge is incident to u and to v. OK, let's go ahead and uh, express the three coloring property. So, so we want to express that our graph can be colored with three colors. So how do we do this in uh, monadic, monadic second order logic? Um, well, what we need to express is that uh, so there are three independent sets of the graph that form a partition of the vertex set. So there exists subsets of vertices R, G, and B. Uh, so and what we need to express is that they partition the vertex set, and each of them is an independent set. So how do you express that they are a partition? Well, we need that for every vertex in the graph, it is in exactly one of these sets. So it's either the case that it's, the vertex is in R, but not in G and not in B, or that it is in G, but not in the other two, or that it is in, that it is in B, but not in, in the other two. Um, what we are missing is still to define what it means for a vertex subset to be an independent set. And so to say that X is an independent set, we can say that there doesn't exist an edge between any two vertices in X. So it is not the case that there exists a vertex u in x and there exists a vertex v in x such that the two vertices are adjacent. Okay, so this formula here expresses the property that the graph can be colored with um, three colors. H how long is this formula? Well, if we well, replace the definitions of independent and partition, well, we will see that, okay, it's quite long, but it has constant size. So meaning that um, three coloring parameters by three widths will be fixed parameter tractable. So by just giving this, ex this uh, monadic second order, order formula here for the three coloring problem, or for the three coloring property, we immediately get the result that three coloring parameterized by the triwits of the graph is FPT. So because the so what we have is that uh, um, testing the validity of a monadic second order logic formula on a graph is FPT parameterized by the triwits of the graph plus the length of the formula. And if it's FPT parameterized by the triwits plus some constant, then it's also FPT parameterized by the triwits. Because well, if our function here has the triwits plus some constant, uh, then this function can also be upper bounded by some other function on just the triwits, where we incorporate this constant into the function. Okay, so by Cosell's theorem and our MSO formula for three coloring, we have that three coloring is FPT with parameter three widths. Um, let's now look at the logic problem. So we are leaving the space of graph problems, but we still want to use three widths. Um, and the way we do this is that we associate a graph with the instance, take a tree decomposition of this graph, 
and then uh, express it in MSO and uh, just use Coursera's theorem. Okay, and, and this uh, 3D composition of uh, the, the graph that's associated with an instance um, is often a primal graph or an instance graph or the dual graph of a Sienna formula. So if we have a Sienna formula, um, F, that has uh, five clauses, and I write the clauses here. Um, then we can look at the primal graph, the dual graph, and the incidence graph. So what's the primal graph? Um, well, the vertices are all the variables of the formula. And we have an edge between two vertices if these two variables occur together in some clause. So that's how the primal graph is defined. Um, for the dual graph, the vertices are the clauses of the formula, and we have an edge between two vertices if the corresponding clauses share at least one variable. And for the incidence graph, um, our vertices are both um, the, the variables and the clauses. And now we have an adjacency if a variable occurs in a clause. So this is a bipolar graph. Um, and we can obtain actually the dual graph from the incidence graph by um, contracting these uh, variable vertices into mm, the clause vertices. And also we can obtain the primal graph from the incidence graph by, well, basically, we could remove the, those uh, clause vertices and just uh, add a direct edge, right? Okay, so now we have three parameters um, for Sienna formulas. We have the primal triads, the dual triads, and the incident, incidence triads of a Sienna formula. So now we can look at problems like uh, satisfiability and ask whether they are FPT parameterized by these parameters. Uh, so this definition just recaptures what we just said, how the primal graph, the dual graph, and the instance graph are defined, um, and then that the primal triwits, the dual triwits, and the incidence triwits are the triwits of these corresponding graphs. So the incidence graph gives us most information because it tells us exactly which variables occur in which clauses. Um, and it turns out that also the incidence triwits is the most general of these three parameters. Namely, if one of the other two parameters is bounded, then the incidence triwits is also bounded. So let's first compare incidence triwits and primal triwits. And this lemma tells us that's, that the incidence triwits of a formula is at most the primal triwits of the formula plus one. So the way we are going to prove this is that we are going to take an optimal tree decomposition of the primal graph and transform it into a tree decomposition of the instance graph whose width is at most one more than the previous tree decomposition. Okay, so we're going to look at some uh, clause. It contains, let's say it contains uh, three variables. And what do we know about the primal graph? So we know that well, these three clause, these three vertices occur in the primal graph, and we know that they are all adjacent to each other uh, because they occur together in a clause. So they form a clique. And so we have seen that if our graph contains a clique, then we must be able, or we must, so the tree decomposition must contain all of these vertices inside a bag. So we know that our primal tree decomposition has a bag that, can, that contains all of these three vertices. So what we are now going to do is, and it, might, it might contain more vertices, but at least these three. So what we are going to do is, um, we now need to construct a tree decomposition for the incidence graph. 
So we somehow need to be able to add these uh, clause vertices into the tree decomposition. And for this, we are going to take this bag, copy it, add the same vertices, but now we add one more vertex, which is our clause vertex. And we are going to do this for every clause in our formula. So for every clause, we are going to take a bag that contains all the variables of this clause and add an adjacent bag that contains, well, the copy of the previous bag plus the clause vertex. Um, and if, if there's another clause that contains these three variables, we are going to add another bag, right, that contains, well, this other clause, D, let's say, and the, the variables that, that it contains. So we're never going to increase the, the width of a bag by more than one. Um, and let, let's see if this is a valid tree decomposition. Well, we, we just added this, uh, these degree one vertices to the tree decomposition. So we are going to preserve that this is a tree. We, we will not add any cycles by doing this. Um, and so for the connectedness condition, um, assume that the connectedness uh, condition held before, and it still holds because, well, all the bags that we added contain a copy of the previous bag that uh, is adjacent, uh, and a new vertex that occurs only in this new bag. Um, did we cover all the edges of the incidence graph? Well, to what vertices is the clause C connected, but well, it's connected to all the vertices or all the, like the, the variable vertices that occur in the clause. And these are all covered in this bag. Uh, and if we do this for every clause, then we will cover all the edges because every edge of the instance graph is adjacent uh, or is incident to one of the clause vertices. And this is a bipartite graph. Okay. Um, so this works, we have now converted tree decompositions for the primal graph into tree decompositions for the incidence graph with width at most one more. Okay, and we can do a very similar thing for the incidence triwits and the dual triwits. So also the incidence triwits of the formula is at most the dual triwits of the formula plus one. And <clears throat> But it turns out that, well, primal and dual triwits are incomparable. Um, so, and the examples are, the first one is one big clause alone. So we have a huge clause, it contains many variables. Uh, let's say u1, u2, u3, etc. up to un. So, and our primal graph um, now, of course, contains all these, these vertices, and they are all adjacent to each other. So we, we, we get a, a huge click in the primal graph. So we will have a bag that contains all the vertices of this click. So we will we'll have a large bag. Um, but in the dual graph, we just have one single vertex. Uh, and the single vertex has terabits. Um, zero, I guess, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, we can have very large dual triwits, but uh, very small primal triwits. And this is given by, by this example that contains a clause with x and y1, a clause with x and y2, etc., and a clause with x and yn. And uh, so there, the, the primal graph contains uh, it's basically a star where we have x in the middle and then y1 as leaves. And so a star is of course a tree and so it has three with one. Um, but we see that all of these clauses contain x. So all of these clauses in the dual graph will be connected to each other. 
so in the dual graph we will have a large clique and so we will have large trivets. Okay. So now we can look at satisfiability parameterized by the trivets of, let's say, the incidence graph. Um, so the input is a CNF formula F, and the question is whether there's an assignment of truth values to the variables such that the formula evaluates the true. And so if Z is FPT parameterized by the incidence trivets, then Z is FPT parameterized by the other two uh, three with notions as well. Um, okay, so let's try and do this by monadic second order logic. Um, and so the parameter is the incidence trivets. So, of course, for our formula, we can compute the incidence graph, um, but it doesn't have all the information we need to check satisfiability, right? Because so we, we, we know which variables are in which clause, but we don't know whether they occur positively or negatively. Um, we have to fix this somehow, so we have, because we need this information to determine satisfiability. So, so that's why we define a new graph. So now instead of just having variables and clauses, we have literals and clauses. So our vertices are all possible literals of the formula and all the clauses of the formula. And now we have an adjacency, um, let's say between U and C. If um, U, this literal U occurs in C. So negative V uh, is adjacent to E because well, negative V occurs as a literal in E. Okay, so now what does it mean to satisfy the formula if we look at the graph? So in the graph, we need to, um, we need to figure out an assignment to the variables, which means that we need to select literals in this graph. And so a literal in the graph corresponds to, to a vertex, right? And we are, of course, not allowed to, um, to set u to both true and false. Uh, so let's set it to false for now. Maybe we set v to true, uh, etc. And then we check, okay, for, for this assignment, which clauses are satisfied. And now a clause is satisfied, of course, if it contains a literal that we set to true. So if the clause is dominated by a vertex that we selected. So on the top here, uh, so for the literal vertices, we need to select an independent set of these literal vertices because we have an edge between them. Um, so something like this. Um, So this would be an independent set. Maybe we don't even need uh, to give an assignment to the last vertex. Uh, so this is an independent set and it dominates all the clauses. So, so let's check. So clause C is dominated by V, clause D is dominated by negative U, E is dominated by W, um, clause G is not dominated. Okay, so maybe this was not a good choice. Let's put X into our independent set up there. Uh, and now clause H is dominated by Y. We didn't even need a truth value for Z because uh, so either of them will work. Okay, so, so we have reformulated our problem now and said uh, our problem is that there exists an independent set of literal vertices that dominates all the clause vertices. Um, okay, so this is now our problem. And uh, so here we need to use, well, actually colored graphs. So, so we need to, to know, well, which vertices correspond to literals and which vertices correspond to clauses.
So that's something that we need to, some information that we need to add to our model. Um, and then we can solve this problem. So we are looking at colored graphs. And uh, so we already saw how to express that a, a set of vertices is an independent set. And uh, figuring out whether a set of vertices is dominated by some other set of vertices is also easy. Because all we need to do is we, we need to say that well, for every vertex that is a closed vertex, there must exist a vertex that we selected um, that is adjacent to it. Um, and now, so we can easily convince us that using Arnborg et al.'s generalization of Coursell's theorem uh, works. Uh, the only thing we need to make sure is that, well, the tree width of this auxiliary graph is bounded by a function of the incidence tree width. <clears throat> so this here says that uh, the tree width of the auxiliary graph is at most twice the tree width of the incidence graph plus one. Um, so why is that? So let's say that we take a tree decomposition of the incidence graph and we want to modify it uh, so that it becomes a tree decomposition of this auxiliary graph. Um, and so I guess one simple thing that we could do is whenever uh, a bag contains uh, a variable, we replace this variable by both literals uh, of this variable. So, and, and what this implies is that the, the bag, so the maximum bag size doubles at most. Um, so why is the tree width at most the tree widths, or twice the tree widths of the incidence graph plus one? Um, well, if we take uh, tree widths k. So let's say our instance tree width is k. So, so the bag sizes are at most k plus one. Now the bag sizes could potentially double to 2k plus 2. And then, well, the tree width of the resulting graph is the maximum bag size minus 1. So we get 2k plus 1. So this is the incidence graph. And this is the auxiliary graph. OK, so, so we can conclude that the satisfiability is FPT for each of the following parameters, the primary tree widths, the dual tree widths, and the incidence tree widths. <clears throat>